الحمد لله العليم الخبير المتقن نظام العالم بلا معين ونصير فسبحان الله الذي حكمته بالغة وعلمه غزير ونعمه واصلة إلى كل صغير وكبير ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في نقير ولا قطمير ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله الذي هدانا بكتاب منير ودعانا إلى الله بالإنذار والتبشير صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ما دامت الكواكب تسير أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما فصل طالوت بالجنود قال إن الله مبتليكم بنهر فمن شرب منه فليس مني ومن لم يطعمه فإنه مني إلا من اغترف غرفة بيده فشربوا منه إلا قليلا منهم فلما جاوزه هو والذين آمنوا معه قالوا لا طاقة لنا اليوم بجالوت وجنوده قال الذين يظنون أنهم ملاق الله كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله والله مع الصابرين صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, friends and elders Allah has designed a life of discipline for a believer in this world and a life of indulgence in the latter If a person chooses to reverse the role, he'll be in problems in simple language, the very design of this life is a life of discipline. So there is moderate indulgence, and that's the beauty of Islam. It doesn't deny you access to your needs. In English, they say, uh, marriage has thorns in it, but celibacy has no roses. Marriage has thorns in it, but celibacy has no roses. Being married is challenging, but being single is not exciting. Ask people that are single and may Allah make it easy for one and all. Some, some people have challenges, some are hoping, so we need to be sensitive, euphemistic when we address these things, so we're not insensitive to anyone's challenges. Uh, <coughs> so this world by its design in the legislation of the Almighty is a place of discipline. You cannot convert an examination room into a relaxing lounge. I mean, where's the tea station here? Where's the coffee corner? Where's the nibbles? Uh, it's an examination room. Oh, actually, I didn't realize that. Oh, thank you. It's, it's an examination hall. It's an examination hall. Inna ja'alna ma'ala al-ardi zinatan laha li nabluwahum ayyuhum ahsanu amala wa inna la ja'iluna ma'alayha sa'idan juruza in two verses, Allah summarizes human existence on this earth. Whatever adornment, beautification, aesthetics, cosmetics, beauty, splendor, glamour you see around you is zina, adornment. To see how you behave amidst all these adornments. وَإِنَّا لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا صَعِيدًا جُرُزًا And ultimately we will reduce it to a plain land. هَذِهِ هِيَ الدُّنْيَا مِنْ بِدَايَتِهَا إِلَى نِهَايَتِهَا بَهْجَةً وَسُرُورًا ثُمَّ دِمَارٌ وَخَرَابٌ That's the world from its inception to its destruction. كَتَانا اصل المیہ یہ ہے زندگی کا المیہ یہ ہے کہ زندگی کا المیہ یہ نہیں ہے کہ یہ بہت جلدی ختم ہو جاتی ہے بلکہ اصل المیہ یہ ہے کہ ہم بہت دیر سے جینا سیکھتے ہیں زندگی کا المیہ یہ نہیں ہے کہ یہ بہت جلدی ختم ہو جاتی ہے بلکہ اصل المیہ یہ ہے the tragedy of life is not that it passes so quickly. The tragedy of life is we learning to live late. 
It's not how quick time is going, it's how late we realize it. Just when you realize your father was correct, you have a son in your house who thinks you're incorrect. What a cycle. Like your dad told you something and you're like, no, no, actually, well, by the way, I'm not sure. And then you went through the turn of life and, oh, okay, my dad was wise. He knew what he was saying. And just then your son challenges you, but dad, you don't make sense. So uh, the life of Akhirah is a life of indulgence. And throughout the Quran and Sunnah, Allah has impressed upon us how he has put these discipline measures in place for us. And the more there's discipline in a person's life, the more there's beauty to it, there's more excitement to it. So in a world where promiscuity, debauchery, immorality, obscenity is so rife and common, look at the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. He said that if you are attracted to anyone, come home, come to your spouse, glorify your spouse, فَإِنَّ مَعَهَا مِثْلَ الَّذِي مَعَهَا The Prophet ﷺ said, your wife will give you no less. She can offer you the same. She can give you the best. So the hadith is telling you, come home. Find your joy with your own. Discipline yourself. Regulate yourself. Control yourself. And in that there's beauty. In that there's excellency. Whereas today the whole culture is go out, enjoy, indulge, feel free, without limits. Azadi tumara haq, barbadi tumara natija. Azadi tumara haq, barbadi tumara natija. Any human, if you leave him as an unbridled horse, there's going to be havoc in his life. So the scholars say, the analogy of the human soul and the human ego is like the horse and the rider. So when you get on the back of a horse, then uh, the horse will examine the confidence of the rider. Anybody who rides a horse will know that. It's just basic. The horse would examine you to see your confidence, your authority, your skill, your grip. If you show weakness, and the horse will realize it, and the horse is a very intelligent animal, by the way. Al-khaylu ma'akudun bin awasih al-khayr. The Prophet ﷺ said Allah has attached goodness to the forelock of a horse. Allah swears oath upon oath on a horse. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَا فَالْمُورِيَاتِ قَدْحَا فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ صُبْحَا فَأَثَّرْنَ بِهِ نَقْعَا so in that chapter, which we read so commonly, but rarely do we unpack and explore it, Allah says, the horse, and Allah swears an oath that how it trots and it gallops and it goes into the thick of the battle and then uh, there's sparks from its hooves and there's dust in the air. It risks its own life to give victory to its owner in loyalty for what this man has done for it. And what we refer to the jawab al-qasam in academic language, the question then implied is, O oh man, what is it that you cannot do for your creator what this animal does for its owner? And then Allah says, this man is ungrateful. Hassan Basri says, Kanud means one who remembers the bounty but forgets the giver of the bounty. <coughs> who remembers the bounty but forgets the giver of the bounty. Imagine you give someone a beautiful watch and he raves about the watch but never makes mention of who gave it. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's great. Who gave you the watch? Oh, it's beautiful. Where you got it from? Oh, it's elegant. No, no, you're not hearing what I'm saying. What did you pay for this here? Oh, you must just see this. You know, it blends. Innal insana li rabbihi lakanood. Man is ungrateful. So when you get on the back of this horse, 
right? If you show confidence and you hold the reins firmly, then you are a rider and you ride in the animal. And if you show weakness, then you are a dummy on the back of this animal and the animal rides you. So the horse will drop you, will flip you, you have no control, you don't know where to stop, you don't know how to do it, you don't know what to do, you just ride him on the back. So outwardly, apparently, superficially, it looks like you're in control, but you're not in control, the animal is riding you. And that's the majority of humans today. They are dummies on the back of their ego, their ego is driving them. So now the horse will graze when it wants to graze, it will move when it wants to move. So the rider doesn't pull the reins, the horse dictates the moves. That's what's happening to our life. Our nafs tells us when to sleep, when to eat, when to get up, where to look, who to talk to, how to love. A believer doesn't love like this. Imam Shafi'i said, Sahibtu Sufiya, falam antafi'a minhum illa bi kalimatain. I loved what great luminaries and great scholars and I achieved a lot. The words of Imam Shafi'i, not my words. I don't know anything. And he said, I can summarize my whole life in two words. Wow. These people were so comprehensive. They did so much and yet they could comprehend it, com be comprehensive. We do nothing and we still cannot, you know what, be concise. Al-waqtu sayfun qata'tahu aw qata'ak. Time is a sword. Either you cut through it or it cuts through you. Number two, your nafs. Shagaltaha bil haqqi aw shagalatka bil baatil. Shagaltaha bil haqqi aw shagalatka bil baatil. Either you dictate to yourself what to do, or then it dictates to you what to do. Either you're going to say, hey, I'm going to rise at four because I'm going to pray tahajjud, and I'm fasting tomorrow because I've got to prepare for Ramadan. Or then it will just tell you to peruse, to indulge, to relax, just to kill your time. Hazar kaam hai daag dunya mein karne ke, jo log kuch nahi karte hai, kamal karte hai. Hazar kaam hai daag dunya mein karne ke, jo log kuch nahi karte hai, kamal karte hai. There's just so much to do, and then it's like, I don't know what to do. What? That's not the language of a believer. From the time the human considered surplus wealth and excess time as a personal commodity, this human has just been nose diving. It's my time. It's my health. Nothing is mine. Nothing is yours. Everything is Allah's. Ya'lamu khainat al-a'yun. Allah refers to the abuse of the eye, the roaming of the gaze, as betrayal of the trust. You only use the word betrayal when you must use a trust. You don't use the word betrayal when you must use something of your own. Khainat al-a'yun. The abuse of the tongue, Allah says it's, it's betrayal. Because that's amana. And this whole body is an amana. And this time is an amana. Everything. So, in a nutshell, what I said to you was, Allah has designed this life as a life of discipline. This is it. You, now, now, if you're challenging the maker in his very design, you, you're trying to swim up, upstream. You're trying to swim upstream. It, it doesn't. You swim downstream. You don't swim upstream. You're against the current. You're fighting, you're fighting the system. This world is not designed for indulgence. But of course, the marketing world is telling you, just do it, just enjoy it, just indulge in it, just make it happen, just go. And you see, so there is this body and there's the soul. The real human is the soul. The body is the covering. Islam does not deny you, in fact it impresses upon you to protect the cover as well. Because it cases and houses the soul. So you've got to look after this. The human body is made of two. You have the casing and you have the soul. The actual body, or the actual human is the soul. 
This is a, it's a covering, it's a casing. That's why it's evolving. Uh, when, you, when you look at your baby picture when you were young, ah, those days the cameras were not good. No, that's you. You can say the cameras were good or the camera, that's you. It's changing. It's, it's, not, it's not the real thing. When you were young, it was like this and like this and like this and like this. That's it. It's changing. The cure for the external is earthly, whether conventional or alternative, but earthly. You've got a cut here, you've got a wound here, you've got sick here, you need a herb here, you need a pill here, you need a tablet here. However, it's earthly. The cure for the soul <coughs> is heavenly, because the soul is heaven. There are, listen to this carefully, my brother. There are instances where the physical body has been cured through divine medication. Person read a verse of the Quran and Allah cured him. But there isn't a single instance where the soul was cured through something material. Did you hear what I said? There are instances, and we could combine and merge and marry the two, and one does not contradict the other. You are unwell, read the, the du'as, read the you know, verses of the Qur'an, take your medication, and of course, Allah will cure you through verses of the Qur'an. The hadith is in Bukhari, where the Sahaba were out in a campaign, and then there was a group of people, their leader <coughs> was stung and the venom was traveling in his body and they were desperate and they came to the companions. The hadith is in Bukhari and they said, uh, can any one of you help us? Our leader has been stung. Can you do anything? So he said, yeah, but uh, you need to give me something. So he said, okay, we'll give you this flock of sheep. He says, no problem. Then he recited Surah Fatiha and blew on him and Allah cured him. So they gave him a lamb, few sahaba felt, is this the right thing or not? Was it correct or not? So then they brought it to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, if you have some, give me, I will also eat of it. <laughs> just the hadith. The whole academics, the scholars have explained and everything. In essence, <coughs> he was bitten, he had venom. Verses of the Quran were recited and Allah cured him. But there is not a single example, there is not a single example of someone whose soul was restless and the comfort of that soul was in the glitter and the glamour and the flamboyance and the opulence of this world. Internally the soul is restless and then you know what, uh, take him out and let him indulge and that would give him comfort, not a single example. As I mentioned, that this life is a life of discipline. And the more a person brings himself into the system of discipline, the more wholesome his life becomes. In the limitations of Islam, there is true freedom. And in the apparent, apparent freedom of others, there is destruction. You, you, you look at the alcoholic industry, drink, indulge, enjoy, and then see the related road rage, see the related carnage, see the related offspring effects of that. Look at the gambling industry. I read an article of a compulsive gambler that it is said compulsive gamblers wear adult diapers because of their level of addiction when they playing. So even when they need to relieve on pass water, they cannot leave that they have to wear adult diapers. This is where addiction can take a person to. Look at the system of interest and usury and the disparity that it creates. It creates a wider gap and a wider gap. The rich become wealthier and wealthier. Some time back, I read an article of BBC that the world's riches, 1%, has the same amount of wealth as the world's remaining 99%.
Now, what's such a disparity in the world, you can imagine the rise of social evils. Envy, jealousy, antagonism, resentment, dislike. What's such a disparity? And what was the passion of Sahaba when the Muhajirin migrated from Mecca and they came to Medina and then the Prophet wasallam paid them up? So... Sa'ad bin Rabi' radiyallahu anhu says, Akha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bayni wa bayna Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiyallahu anhu had immigrated from Mecca and he came to Medina and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this pay. You are a pay to him, you are a pay to him, that's your brother, that's your brother. Subhanallah, like unimaginable. That's your brother, take him home and okay, yeah. Start life together. Wow. And so, when Abdurrahman ibn Auf came home, then uh, he says himself, he says, Sa'ad bin Rabi' the first thing he told me, he says, congratulations, the Prophet of Allah has paid you up with me. I'm happy to inform you, I am one of the wealthiest people of Medina. If I'm paid up, I don't want anyone to know what my finances are. Why must he know? Because then, you know, his mind would run. Inni aktharul ansari mala. Inni aktharul ansari mala. Now listen to these words. And this could only happen by the teachings of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fa'uqsimu laka nisfa mali. As of today, whatever I own... I will transfer ownership of half of my assets to you. <coughs> this is when you understood it's not your wealth. It's an amana. It's an amana. And you read about these celebrities whose life outwardly looks glamorous. I always say in my talks, you know, you see that billboard of that <coughs> celeb with his wife and a stroller and a baby at an exotic location with a broad smile. The only time they smiled was when they took that picture. <laughs> if you go into their lives now in that house, I swear by Allah there's no smiles, there's tears. That very billboard, like wow, this thing, just look at how perfect everything is. The skin tone, the watch, the dress. The smile, the hairstyle, the orthodontics, the, the, the embrace, the stroller. Whoa, this thing just makes for an ad on every level. And dangle that candy before the whole world to look at how glamorous this life is. But go in his life and her life, there's nothing. That's why their lives are where they're ending up. <coughs> because you're fighting a system of nature. Allah's system is discipline, discipline. Nowadays, the whole world talks of intermittent fasting, and that's the best way to shed weight. Oh, okay, intermittent fasting. It's like my Prophet didn't tell me, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about this year. 16 hours and beyond. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, used to have so many wisal. So many wisal was uninterrupted three days of fasting. And of course, that was his exclusive, the Sahaba endeavored, and he said, don't try, this is something that only I can do. So he doesn't get interrupted or ended or terminated at, at, at uh, dusk or at sunset. It continues. But that was the speciality of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just a life of discipline. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yuqabbiluni wa huwa sa'im. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to kiss me while he was fasting. Wa ayyukum yamliku irbahu. And which one of you can have control over his need and his desire as the Prophet of Allah had control over himself? The Prophet ﷺ had absolute control, beauty, discipline, restraint. And that's the beauty of Islam. And that's what Allah wants. Allah loves that we live with discipline. And then I've, I've kept this other world. It's there, it's real, it's absolute, it's tangible, it's everlasting, it's unending. So the beauty of Islam is that though the latter abode is the absolute, Islam doesn't deny you moderate indulgence in this world. 
You know, generally it's like, I've got it for you later, so nothing for you now. No, Islam is not that. It's here. قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Enjoy this world as well. So I recited a verse. فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ Talut was a king. It was in the time of Dawood alayhi salatu was salam. And they were going to challenge the mighty force of Jalut. Talut was a Muslim, good ruler. Uh, and uh, so through the inspiration conferred upon the prophet of the time, which was then communicated to him, and that's the view uh, expressed by the experts on the commentary of the Quran. <coughs> They were passing by a river. Some people argue geograph geographically it is a river that borders between Jordan and Iraq. In one of my visits there, some local people cited to me that this is the location. Wallahu alam on its uh, location being that. But nonetheless, the Quran says this here, and the principle of tafsir is abhimu ma abhamahullah. Leave ambiguous what Allah has left ambiguous. Leave vague what Allah has left vague. Focus on what Allah told you. You don't have to uh, unpack and unravel things that are not mentioned. If it was important for your guidance, Allah would have mentioned it. The whole story of Yusuf alayhi and then you want to find out if they got married. I mean, focus on the modesty and the restraint of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. The whole tale and narrative of Sulaiman alayhi salam in Bilqis, and then you want to know if nikah took place. The whole incident of Musa and Khidr, then you want to know if Khidr is alive. You know, we, we, we lose the point. We lose the point. Focus on the, the message that the Quran is telling you. So anyway, <coughs> they were passing by a river. So he said to his people, Allah is going to test you. Allah is going to test you. Inna Allah binahar. Allah is going to test you with this water. Now they were thirsty and they passed in water. What did I say? This is the design that Allah has made of this earth here. Stay here, behave, behave. But like I told you, the beauty is in moderation, indulgence is fine. Don't bite on the bait of temptation unless you know what is dangling beneath it. Don't bite on the bait of temptation. Story what happens outside. Listen to me. I kid you not. If you bite here, there's a gentleman outside. He'll roll you up. And then he'll pull you out in seconds. You might get a little throw. You might get something to eat. But he rolls you, grips you. It's a fight for him. It's a throw. It's exhilaration. It's adrenaline. He hooks you up, rolls you up, pulls you out. Pulls you out. You tremble. Within seconds, you die. He drops you in the trunk of his car. Yeah? I promise you. I kid you not. Then he takes you home. Then his wife chops you up in pieces. Okay? And then after that, she fries you. Hot burning oil spices you. You present it as a delicacy. There's eight people sitting around a table. With 30 odd teeth, they grind you. That's about what happens to you. Okay, give me a minute, I'll be back. Takes a swim around and comes back. No, 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 you're trying to deprive me. There's no rod, there's no human, there's no car, there's no trunk, there's no oil, there's no spice, there's no woman, there's no table, nothing. Hang on, I'm telling you what's going to happen outside the water. You're trying to explore it within the water. My Nabi, your Nabi told us, don't bite. You'll suffer in the grave. This will strike at you. This will eat you. This will destroy you. Lawla Allah tadafanu, ladaoutu Allah an yusmi'akum min adhabil qabri. 
if it wasn't for the fear that you'll stop bearing your disease, I would have asked Allah to unveil and unmask the torment of the grave so you can see with the naked eye what's happening. But if Allah were to do that, you won't have the courage to bury anyone. So I haven't requested this from Allah. It's authentic hadith. So my Nabi told you, my Nabi told me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is what's going to happen. Don't bite on this. Just don't bite. There's a whole journey after this. And I'm saying, no, well, I look at the grave, I look around, I don't see punishment, I don't see angel, I don't see anything. I often say, because I travel a lot, I say, you know, you could be buried next to each other, but your abodes could be very different. The boarding gates are next to each other, but the destinations are different. Two, two, two different airlines are boarding next to each other. One's a domestic flight, one's an international flight. They parked on the tarmac next to each other. It would be, oh no, they're going same year. They're taking off on the same runway. No, 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 no. We take off like this, but we go in different directions. We might be going to a common cemetery, but we're going in different directions. We're going in different directions, my brother. We can only pray that Allah grants us Jannah. That's it. But the boarding gates are together. Some are going this way. Some are going that way. So Talut told his people, Allah is going to test you. فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever will drink and indulge, he's not from me. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَطْعَمْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي And whoever will not drink, he remains part of me. إِلَّا مَنْ اِغْتَرَفَ غُرْفَةً بِيَدِي A verse of the Quran, chapter 2, Surah Baqarah. But the one who just takes in his palm. So, so much. Drink so much. And that's the message. Drink in moderation. Drink in moderation. You're allowed to drink so much. فَشَرِبُوا min. The Quran says, they started consuming in volumes. Two things happen. The more they drank, the more their thirst was aggravated. But that's not all. Immediately, lethargy set in. They became lame. They became sluggish. They became lethargic. And they lost their momentum and their drive. And they like, no, well, I don't think it's really good to join. And I don't even have the cloud. The wind was out of their sails. The wind was out of their sails. The game was over. But those who drank little, those who drank little. I was on a flight from Brisbane to Perth. It was Ramadan. I had a morning program, hopped onto the flight, and then my program was in Perth. There was a gentleman sitting next to me. And uh, so he asked for some alcohol, alcoholic beverage. They gave him, he drank. It was a long flight, domestic flight, but five hours. For domestic, it's relatively long. And then after a little while, he asked again, they gave him. After a little while, he asked, and they gave him, and they said, sir, you're becoming rowdy. And uh, you're becoming a nuisance and you've exceeded, you know, the amount that you can consume. And he was becoming aggressive. And I was fasting in Ramadan and I just started cheering. Allah, how beautiful is this deen that you've given us? This man is drinking and drinking and drinking. And he's getting more agitated and more aggravated. And Allah's given you. You know, every month in Ramadan, people tell me and people tell us all, Say, oh, you know, I don't know how you people fast. So I say to them, it's not only you who don't know how we fast, even I don't know how we fast. You say, I don't understand how your kids can fast. I'm like, never mind, you don't know, even I don't know. Because it's not us, it's Allah that makes it happen. <coughs> if if it was a logical thing, then 
you know what, Muslim men would have been the easiest men in the kitchen, and probably that's the furthest from the reality. <laughs> because, oh, this is a nation that fasts, man. They can go 15 hours without it. So if the meal is delayed 20 minutes, oh, it's nothing for them. But chalk and cheese, outside Ramadan, this man is different altogether. Right? So it's how Allah makes it possible. It always seems impossible till you do it. You could read it as impossible or you could read it as I'm possible. It's what you decide. It's a life of discipline, my brother, and then it's beauty in it. It's beauty. Ask a man who restrains himself and restrains his gaze. His wife will be a new bride for him every day. And wallah, if he doesn't restrain his gaze, even day one, she won't be a new bride for him. Even day one, she won't be a new bride for him. Though to the world, it's day one. But there's no thrill. It's just all oh, empty. It's just like pop the balloon and you'll see there's nothing inside. There's no rapport. There's no connection. There's no feeling. There's nothing to it. But when there's discipline, it takes the hunger of a day to culminate in iftar. And if there's no hunger of the day, it's dinner, it's not iftar. It's the hunger of a day. You, you could cheat and then sit down on the iftar table, but then you won't get that feeling that a fasting person has. Ask a fasting man who's observed a fast, when he opens his fast, is there any language or any words that can describe that emotion? Wallah, impossible. That feeling and that completion. And what the Prophet ﷺ said, Inshallah. How amazing. The sun has set. The day has ended. The fast has opened. The thirst has quenched, the veins are drenched, and Allah is happy. Wow. That feeling of completion, only a believer can feel it. You cannot enjoy that excitement of iftar, even if you sit on the iftar table with fellow fasting individuals, Unless you observe the fast. That's the reality. You have to behave for the day to enjoy that culmination. The noble companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they were out in the journey of Umrah in Hudaybiyah. And then, of course, the whole thing that had happened where unfortunately they were denied Umrah. And they were in the state of ihram. So when you're in the state of ihram, you cannot hunt. Or if you're in the precincts of the haram, as part of the sanctity of the Kaaba. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqtulu s-sayda wa antum hurum wa man qatalahu minkum muta'amida fa jazaa'un mithlu ma qatala minan na'am يحكم به ذوى عدل منكم هديا بالغ الكعبة. Oh, you who believe, do not kill the game when you're in the state of ihram. Now look at the test of Allah. The companions, unfortunately, the disbelievers of Mecca denied them access, so they couldn't perform the umrah. But in that state of ihram, Allah tested them by bringing the game so close to them. I'm from Africa and I love safari and I go hunting and I know what's the eye of a hunter and a PH and a professional hunter. You know what? You look at your scope, you look at the distance, you look at it. It's a good, it's a long shot, it's an animal, it's, it's right, it's got the horns, it's a trophy, whatever it is. Those that are into it. Allah tested the companions that Allah brought the animal so close that you can grab it with your hand. But Allah said, I made it forbidden because you're in the state of ihram, because I want to see who can behave. Who can behave? 
That's what I want to see. And of course, the Sahaba delivered. They behaved on a level that is beyond description. Hence, the Jannah that Allah has given them will be the greatest of it all. So what's my point to you, myself and you, my brother? Our entire life and our entire existence is an amana. It is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the entire Quran, Allah exhorts us to spend. Allah says spend, contribute, donate. But there is barely a place in the Quran where Allah doesn't couple spending by saying, spend from my money. And they donate from my money. And they, they spend from what I gave them. Everywhere in the Quran, Allah says they spend from my money. You know, sometimes a child says, I bought this with my own money. So tell your dad, oh wow. So he's like, yeah, my his money. My his money. Okay, what does my his money mean? Basically, I give him an allowance every day. He put it together. And okay, he bought himself a jacket. He's like, I bought it. Well, okay, but it's, yeah. The whole Quran is replete. Allah says, my money, anfiqu mimma ja'alakum mustakhlafina fi. Spend from that in which I gave you temporary ownership. وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And they spend from that which we gave them. We gave them. This is the kindness and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has opened up the avenues of reaching Him in many ways. This is the beauty of Islam. So, I often give this analogy in my talks that uh, you board an aircraft, right? Uh, you're sitting in a business cabin. There's 70-odd uh, passengers in an A380 business class. And then you nudge the gentleman next to you and you say, hey, listen, what did you pay for your business class ticket? And uh, he says, oh, it set me back, man. It cost me an arm and a leg. And then... Uh, you ask another brother, what did it cost you? And he says, no, you know what? My brother works for the airline industry, so I just had to pay taxes, and I got it. How about you? I had miles, so I just submitted a redemption ticket. Oh, great. You, uh, you know what? I'm loyal and patriotic to the airline, so the economy was overbooked, so they bumped me up. So the 70 odd people sitting in the same cabin enjoying the same perks, but everyone has paid a different price. There will be millions and billions in Jannah, may Allah make us from amongst them. Every Jannati will enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah. But every Jannati will have a different action which attracted Allah's mercy, which was the catalyst for his entry. Hey, how you ended up in Jannah? Brother, you won't believe. I don't have much. My heart was just clean. I never used to harbor anything for anyone. And because of that, Allah forgave me and he gave me Jannah. How about you? Me every day is to serve my mom and Allah was happy with this. What about you, brother? There was a donation. There was a collection happening. And exactly that's what brings us to this beautiful masjid of yours here, alhamdulillah. Uh, and of course, our Imam here would give you more and, and context to it. Uh, what's the name of our masjid? Al Hidayah, Al -Hidayah Allah. And they are doing some extension and expansion. And this is the time, the month of Ramadan, right here at our doorstep. And this is the beauty by virtue of that donation and that contribution. You can earn yourself such closeness that is unbelievable. So when Tabuk took place and the Prophet ﷺ exhorted the Sahaba to spend, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu said, Mi'ata ba'irin bi ahlasiha wa aqatabiha. Hundred camels laden from me. With everything, goods, everything. And then the Prophet ﷺ exhorted again. And Sayyidina Uthman didn't like, okay, the Prophet of Allah is talking to you, I'm done. It's your chance. No, he came forward again. He responded again. And then he came and he gave this chunk of coins and he dropped it. And the Prophet ﷺ started flipping the coins in joy, in happiness. And he said, ما يضر أثمان أو ما ضر أثمان ما فعل بعد هذا. 
Uthman's generosity today has forgiven his previous mistakes and his potential future mistakes. And then the Prophet of Allah made a dua. I haven't come across a dua like this anywhere. غفر الله لك يا عثمان ما قدمت وما أخرت وما أسررت وما أخفيت وما أبديت وما كان منك وما هو كائن إلى يوم القيامة غفر الله I, 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 I cannot even translate it غفر الله لك يا عثمان ما قدمت وما أخرت وما أسررت وما أعلنت وما أخفيت وما أبديت وما كان منك وما هو كائن إلى يوم القيامة May Allah pardon your minor sins, your major sins, the open ones, the secret ones, the past, the present and the future till Qiyamah may Allah pardon and that dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is there for us as well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, every day two angels descend. And one angel says, Allahumma a'ti munfiqan khalafa wa a'ti mumsikan talafa. Oh Allah, whoever spends, give him a replacement. So Allah says in the Quran, Whoever donates, spends, Allah will replace. In Ma'rif al-Quran, Mufti Shafi'i rahimahullah has written, the declaration of the Quran is replacement. And the Quran didn't say monetary replacement. Allah said he'll replace. We generally, if I gave 100 pounds or 1,000, I want my 10,000. No, the verse of the Quran is give, I'll replace. Allah didn't say monetary replacement. He could return it with monetary or something else, but he promises to return. And then furthermore, he writes that sometimes what happens is when you donate, then Allah replaces your donation with peace and contentment and rids your heart of greed, which is a more wholesome replacement than monetary return. So if you gave a thousand and Allah gave you ten thousand, but you're greedy for a hundred thousand. You gave a thousand, Allah gave you ten thousand, but you're greedy for a hundred thousand. Then it is more wholesome that you gave the thousand and Allah just gave you peace. Allah gave you peace. يُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَرْحَمُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَإِلَيْهِ تُقْلَبُونَ a verse of chapter 29, Surah An-Kabut. يُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاء Allah can punish whomsoever He wishes. In, in Tafsir, Madariq Al-Tanzeel, Allama Nasafi writes, يُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِالْحِرْسِ وَيَرْحَمُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِالْقَنَاعَةِ Allah can punish whomsoever He wishes by unleashing greed in His heart. Just making Him, as His greed. And Allah can have mercy on you by endowing you with peace, with happiness, with contentment. You're satisfied. Look, look at the aesthetic world today and cosmetic world today. There's just nobody is happy how they look. It's just constantly. Me, I just make everybody happy. Oh, you're looking crispy like a cucumber. <laughs> I just tell everyone, oh wow, you're looking crispy like a cucumber. Every, just tell anybody they're looking young and they are just elated and jubilant. Because that's the world everybody wants. Oh, what a compliment. Oh, I won't forget that. Just make people happy to look young. Nobody's happy. They Appearance, their tone, their presentation, their physique, their six-pack, their muscles, their biceps. Just, just, just be. وَلَا آمُرَنَّهُمْ فَلَا يُغَيِّرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ وَلَا آمُرَنَّهُمْ فَلَا يُغَيِّرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ Amongst the vows that the devil made, he said, I'm going to cause havoc on this earth. And one thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to make man restless on the appearance that Allah gave him. He just won't be happy. May Allah give us contentment, peace, peace, peace with your spouse, peace with your children, happiness with your surroundings, happiness, peace. If you've got peace at heart, 
then you're a happy man. And if you don't have peace and you're chasing and you're hankering and you're yearning and you're pining and you're longing, you're restless, you're on edge, you're on edge, you're fighting all the time. You, 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 huh? Aaj log apne dukh se dukhi nahi hai, dusro ke sukh se dukhi hai. Aaj log apne dukh se dukhi nahi hai, dusro ke sukh se dukhi hai. People are not depressed because of their own pain. They depress because of the prosperity. Brother, why are you so sad? Yeah, his daughter got married. <laughs> no, I didn't get you there. Why are you sad? Yeah, my neighbor bought a car. You don't have a car? No, I have three cars. No, but then why are you sad? Yeah, he bought a car. So, so, no, he wasn't supposed to buy. I know of a man who was living in a very wealthy circle. And mashallah, he was the boy, the blue-eyed, the wealthy, the affluent, the rich, the elite. And he decided to move to an upper and more wealthy area. And when he got there, suddenly now he wasn't the rich man in the area. The man actually went down due to depression because he relocated to a place where the community was more affluent and suddenly he was now just mediocre and average whereas previously he was the champion and he was the king where he was living but he needed to move to a more upper end area but when he got the hang on his challenge was with people with much more clout and muscle and the man just went downhill like this year in terms of his health just because he when he came out of his veranda and his his house and he looked out there were homes that were much more opulent than his so every day the angel makes dua allahumma a'ti mumsikan talafa wa a'ti munfiqan khalafa allah whoever spends you replace you substitute you give him and whoever withholds you destroy now imagine if the angel makes dua for us you don't need better and if the angel curses us who's going to undo that for us so alhamdulillah uh, the request would be presented to you every masjid is the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a believer's investment is in his deen these are our investments these are our investments that will mature for us that will mature for us and this is the beauty of Islam that you could earn the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as you could do it and I always say to people I say that Allah has given everyone different strength tap onto the strength that Allah has given you somebody are good in the neighborhood mashallah mobilizing helping supporting good great do it with the right motivation and Allah will give you immense reward some people are very selfless in serving people amazing some people are great in reciting quran awesome and some people allah has given them the passion to spend and donate and contribute great wonderful amazing the more you do it whatever talent allah has given you the beauty of islam is through each avenue you could reach your creator uh, suhail bin amr says that uh, one day myself and my family we were attacked by some robbers and uh, they came and then they started looting uh, and then they snatched our belongings and they took our food and they started eating and they took everything but the leader of the the bandits and the thieves he wasn't eating so i said to him like you steal you loot you rob and they all eating you're not eating what's the matter he said no i'm fasting like you're kidding me bro you're kidding me bro what are you up to man you you're stealing in front of me so he says what's this like, he says no I, I i i i observe a fast so i asked him you steal you loot and you fast he says i only have one good action and i don't want to lose that one good action and I'm hopeful one day this good action will be the catalyst of total change in my life. And he said, two years later, I met the same robber, bandit, thief, thug at the Kaaba. And he said to me, I told you, Inni atruku bayni wa bayna Allahi baba la'alli adkhulu feehi yawmamma. I have one action with my creator and I develop on it. One day it will open the way for me and it has opened the way and I have turned the leaf and the page on the life of sin. 
So today is your opportunity by spending, by donating, by contributing. Allah, I'm weak. Allah, I have so much sense. Allah, this great month is to dawn upon me. Allah, I need that push start. I want to leap forward. Ya baghil khair aqbil wa ya baghil sharr aqsir. What's the proclamation made? O seeker of good, leap, advance, go. This is your chance. Wholesale, this is the pardon that's going to come. And O sinner, back off, go slow, halt, pause, enough. It's enough. So I urge you, I urge you, my brother, support this initiative. And let's see how we can invest in this year. Whatever we have, if we use it for the deen of Allah, then in doing so, we preserve what Allah gave us. I'll leave you with one incident and I'll end. There was an incident back home where there was a collection taking place at a masjid. And this brother narrated this to me himself. He says, I'm sharing it with you so you can convey it to the world. So I said, okay, that's fine. Anyway, he said they had put up very sick. And he mentioned this incident to me, so I'm sharing it. He said, uh, I got very sick. MashaAllah, Allah has blessed him with a lot of wealth. And he says, I was flown to a neighboring country for treatment. And as I'm lying on my hospital bed and I'm looking at that graph, and it was looking very, very critical. And uh, in my heart, I'm saying Allah, because he's, he's got a lot of, uh, you know, fancy toys, if you want to call it private yacht and a private jet ski and a villa here and an offshore insurance and this and uh, investment and whatever. And he says, I'm sitting here and I'm saying, Allah, this is for you. Allah, my jet ski. Allah, my villa. Allah, my apartment. Allah, my luxury home. Allah, my this. Allah, my car. Allah, my watches. Allah, my investment. Allah, I'll give this to you. And uh, it's because I'm just seeing my life is just going, going, going. He mentioned this to me. I'm in the house of Allah. And he says, everybody was praying and making dua. And then I started taking a turn and positively improving. And he said, how, how evil of man. As soon as I started seeing improvement, I could almost see my attachment growing again to my assets. He says, like, I'm telling myself, but yesterday you were relinquishing. Yesterday you were let go in because you could see that graph going down and you knew it's now touch and go. Many a vows made in storm are forgotten in calm. Many a vows made in storm are forgotten in calm. When the waters are stormy and the waters are rough and the tides are high, then you just say it, Allah this, Allah this, Allah this, Allah this. And then when the waters calm, then suddenly you hold it back. He says, I'm actually like I can feel the throttle again of my jet ski. The, these were his words. He said, like yesterday, I'm saying, Ya Allah, what am I going to do with this? It's, it's done. It's over. So let it go. And as soon as I started seeing improvement, and he cried because I gave this talk, and he heard it, and he said, Wallah, you were talking to me. I'm saying, my brother, Allah says, this is the condition of the munafiqeen. They say, when Allah gives them, they will give. Yet when Allah gives them, they withhold. A believer is one when Allah gives him, in English, they say, when the Almighty blesses you with more, don't up your standard of living, increase your standard of giving. Increase your giving. I'll leave you on that note. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with a good Ramadan, inshallah. A Ramadan full of commitment, discipline, and inshallah that we can become an asset to the ummah and remember a life of indulgence in this world equates a life of deprivation there. Our life, our health, wealth is an amana from Allah. It's an amana from Allah. فَحْذَرْ زَوَالَ الْفَضْلِ يَا جَابِرْ وَأَعْطِ مِنْ دُنْيَاكَ مَنْ سَأَلَهَا فَإِنَّ ذَا الْعَرْشِ جَزِيلُ الْعَطَى يُضَعْفُ بِالْحَبَّةِ أَمْثَالَهَا uh, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said to Jabir, the more you spend, the more you multiply. The more you increase, the more you attract more. So I'm optimistic, inshallah. It's the first time I've been visiting this masjid, but I heard a lot about it. May Allah bless you all. Inshallah, you would oblige and respond and spend generously to the cause. Barakallahu feekum.